Welcome to the Hey Kings podcast brought to you by Vermeer. Today on the Hey Kings podcast, I'm joined by Timothy Damon. Timothy farms, uh, funny enough, Timothy Hay in northern Idaho on the periphery of the Palouse and at the foothills of the Bitterroot Mountains. Today we're going to talk about those hills that he farms. We're going to talk about some equipment and weeds, and we'll talk a little bit about transition planning and how his family's thinking about it. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. I'm in the most soundproof thing I can find. I'm in that tractor cab, so. <laughs> <laughs> that should work pretty good. Tell me about your operation. So my dad and my, my uncle, they, they're farming um, about 5,600 acres or so. We're growing Timothy hay, obviously. That's, that's our, kind of our bread and butter right now is all for export. So we grow about 3,000 acres of Timothy hay, and then the rest of that, is all annual cropping. So, um, wheat, garbanzo beans, we've grown peas. Uh, this year we're growing canola and we're going to try some oats. Basically anything we grow up here in the Pacific Northwest or you name it, we've, we're, we're (laughs) trying to grow it. (laughs) You're going to give it a shot this year. Just, we're going to give it a try. Yeah. Now, now you say that that's quite the list. Is -hmm. that because there's just no clear winner as to what you should be planting. Nothing, nothing looks that profitable. That's part of it. I think the other part of it too is kind of where we're located, and we're kind of right at the foothills of the Bitterroots, and we're right, kind of right at the very edge of the Palouse. So we're in this unique position where, where we have some of our ground is in this really good dirt, you know, Palouse dirt, and then. Most of our ground is in this timber soil that low pH and doesn't low yield. pH. And 50 years ago was covered in trees. You know, and 50 years ago, a lot of this ground was trees and, and they cleared it off. You know, the guys that bought it cleared it off and farmed it. And 50 years ago, they could make, you know, they could make money growing wheat on that ground. Just the way the economy is, is right now. You just, you can't do that anymore and that's what's forced us into to doing grass crops we used to grow uh bluegrass for seed years ago and for for many years my dad and my uncle basically got by growing bluegrass for seed and uh it wasn't until we started growing hay that we really started doing well but we've always been trying trying to grow wheat or trying to grow some sort of legume or any basically anything (laughs) so because every once in a while we get you know we get a good crop up here in this you know this timber soil we'll get a good crop and it makes us think well we can grow wheat then the next year we get a drought or something happens and we grow 50 bushel wheat we have folks from all over the country listening to this podcast when you're talking about good yields what's a good yield on that winter so a, a good yield for wheat fall wheat is 60 bushel 60 to 70 bushel in there if and that's if on a good year i'd say average is about 60 all right and then and then on our better dirt our good dirt is not the primo palouse dirt last year we got 90 bushel on it and that's on a two-year rotation of a legume and fall wheat so 90 bushel wheat that's that's pretty good for us there's somebody listening in oklahoma to this that just tipped over dead (laughs) <laughs> and, well, then, and then yeah, you start I'm, talking about irrigated wheat in central washington and we're setting world records yeah i know of a guy 30 miles south of here kind of around pullman they can grow 130 bushel dry land wheat no problem now is that hard red winter wheat uh, no that would that would be just regular soft white winter that's amazing wheat. i mean they got the perfect dirt they got the perfect moisture i mean i mean they do really well the dirt is down there is that good there's something that i really want to talk about on your farming Mm -hmm. operation you're raising timothy for export harvesting Mm -hmm. putting up in big bales three by four Mm -hmm. big square bales but you have some hillsides (laughs) yeah yeah we do and and there's some folks back east that say yeah i have a steep hill and yeah Mm -hmm. i can have a, a square bale roll down a hill isn't that just about everything that you have yeah we have I think one field that's dead flat and even that field has a small hill in it. And, uh, the area we're in, we farm some pretty wild ground. 
I mean, we have field names like one, we call it Suicide Hill because it's so steep and so wild that it's suicide to go up there. (laughs) It It came uh, by the name, honestly. Yeah, it is. It's an intense hill. And we've had multiple guys slide off the hills before. In fact, my dad, one time, he destroyed a swather one time, pulling up to the top of a hill. He blew a hose and didn't know it. Turned sideways. The machine lost all oil pressure and run away. And he had to jump off the swather and and, uh, it ran down into the trees and and basically totaled the swather. (laughs) So... You know, we're we're dealing with some pretty intense stuff up here. As you're running your three by four baler, there's guys that get mm-hmm. away with a hundred and seventy five horse big frame John Deere tractor mm-hmm. pulling a three by four big baler. What are you guys using? Well, our biggest tractor well we're pulling Heston twenty two seventy balers with we have a three eighty five articulated Steiger tractor and we have a, a three fifty articulated steiger tractor and uh these balers will push these tractors around on these hills i don't know those uh horsepower rating are those numbers the horsepower ratings yeah 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 so it's 385 horsepower and 350 horsepower (laughs) so you're using basically twice the horsepower that most everybody else would be on that same baler yeah and we don't really use it for the horsepower i mean I'd say in general, we're probably using, you know, our load on the engines is, for, you know, about 50% all the time, you know, maybe a little more when you're pulling a hill or something. But the main reason we have them is we need the weight, <laughs> you know, the weight to stick on a hill or because these balers are heavy and they'll just, they'll whip a tractor around. If you're turning down a hill or something, I mean, if you look on all the tongues of our balers, they have they have those little rubber marks on the tongue of the baler and it's it's uh not yeah, because you have a really bad operator but because you've been no. jackknifed at one point or another yeah and it happens so fast too when you get jackknifed i mean i don't run a baler very often but but the times i have you know it it happens and when you do it you just you're on a steep hill and you just got to kind of ride it out and steer out of it the best you can there's a pucker factor to it (laughs) (laughs) putting a crease in the seat an extra crease in the seat (laughs) uh, yeah yeah that's one way to put it (laughs) most all of your ground is like that yeah you know i was mentioning field names we we have one more that's basically it's called shaw's mountain and it is literally the this mountain this one side of a mountain I mean, that's another field we have. I mean, I'd say every one of our fields has a hill on it that, you know, if you're not used to it, you're going to get spooked. But we've had, we have a tour come to our farm from Finland, guys from Finland that'll come out to our farm every year. And uh, the reason they come is because their, their climate is similar to ours here in, in our area and the dirt's similar. And, uh, they come out here just to see our equipment. The only the biggest difference between our area and the, the area in Finland where these guys are from is the hills. And one of the things we like to do is we'll take them in a tractor or something, take them up on one of these hills and just watch them squirm. <laughs> just because <laughs> it's it's fun for us and and you know it's it's unique for them because they get to see something or experience something that different mm-hmm. and extreme. Yeah, you started to tell us about combines let's go to combines and then we'll come back and talk about some more hay production stuff because of our hills in our area and this is pretty much the whole Palouse region and and eastern washington pretty much everybody around here runs uh hillside combines and i know there's places in nebraska and you know and there's places up in the northeast that run hillside machines too our area had a combine (laughs) that was developed specifically for our area and it went it leveled over to 42 percent i believe is what it was and uh, it's a it's an international 1470 and we have two three of them actually we ran three of them that's what i ran my whole life up until you know this year i might run something a little different but 
because our, our hills are so steep, we have to run hillside machines, combines. And it's it's another unique aspect of our area. You know, the whole basically everybody on the Palouse runs hillside combines and and you see them um then these new machines are dueled up and big. They don't quite level over as far, but we have to run these big hillside machines just because our hills are so steep. <laughs> That's different. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that the Finlanders love that. They love, because we'll take them on a combine too. Oh, the en- um, the engineering on those are pretty amazing. How you can yeah. go to 42% and keep your center of gravity mm-hmm. so you don't go tumbling down a hill. And when I say yeah. tumbling, you... Oh, you, you know you somebody that's been over in a combine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be there used to be kind of in the older combines when they were a little lighter and smaller. You know, you'd hear stories about combines tipping over all the time. You know, or or doing something dumb. You know, something would happen with a combine there, where somebody could. I mean, people would die. <laughs> right. Um, right. And. Uh, Talk, you're talking least, about flipping combines over. Flip, yeah, tipping a combine over, yeah. And it doesn't happen quite as much anymore. These these newer combines are getting so big and so heavy and, and so wide, too, that that they don't quite, you know, the, they're they're getting safer. And, and that's nice. And people always ask us, why are you farming that? Well, it's like, well, we can make, you know, we can make money on it. So if we can get on the hill, we're going to get on the hill. Let's take a break there and we'll get a word from our sponsor. I'm Danny Juan and, and I switched to the Vermeer 604R because I believe this baler is built to last. I bail about 4,000 bales a year and I think as much money you give for a baler, they need to bail 4,000 bales a year, even if it's for 10 years, they, they need to get it done. The day I ran it, we absolutely had no issues at all. It fired up and I bailed like some guy. <laughs> it just bailed all day long. Hear the full story at makinghay.com slash haykings. Let's go back to uh, Timothy production. Mm-hmm. You're in a unique place, uh, not too different from where I'm at. You're putting up mm-hmm. three, four ton to the acre, Timothy? Yeah, our average is about um, between three and three and a half ton. And you can get up to that four ton to the acre on a single oh, cutting. We've, yeah, we've gotten, uh, I think our best was 4.2 ton yep. to the acre I think is what our best has been. Yeah, first first liar doesn't stand a chance. I went four and a quarter. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but that was on that was only on two acres, and it was some pretty good sub sub irrigated yeah. ground. But uh, yeah. certainly Timothy well, has some production capacity. Yeah, a funny story. Our our uh, <laughs> that four point two ton we got that was on our flattest field. <laughs> so you know. Now, there is something to be said about farming flat ground. You know, it, you some of our best dirt is in the kind of our flatter areas, but you know, the yep. hills still do well too. So, <laughs> yep, yep. We've spent a lot of time comparing notes on uh, on a weed problem that we have, and it's a grassy weed called Ventanata dubia. Where are you guys at in your thought process? I know that's a weed in uh, oh, I think they have it in Nebraska and in a pasture setting. There are some control options, but quite frankly, Timothy is the most sissy grass on the face of the earth and just wants to roll over and die. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you're if you're dairyman listening to this, uh, Timothy's the equivalent of a Jersey cow. Just yeah. <laughs> They're just looking for an excuse to die. Yeah, it's tough. We haven't found anything. I mean, we've tried different things, different herbicides and fall, apl- fall applied herbicides. I think the best thing for us to do is going to be going with a shorter rotation on our Timothy and trying to control it that way. Cause you know, we sprayed in fall applied application last fall. I've been out fertilizing this spring and I, you know, there's some spots where you think, Oh, I think we did some good. And there's some spots where I was like, ah, well, we didn't do a very good job here. And I think in the grand scheme, we're still, also, we're still just playing around with stuff too. I mean, we're not. Yeah, the, we're still uh, experimenting. Yeah, and, uh, the chemistries that we've used, I think, mm-hmm. I think we're coming to a consensus because uh, I think maybe 150 miles north of you, 
uh, but dealing mm-hmm. with the same problems. I think the consensus that we've come to is some of those chemistries that are so hard on Timothy, we're, we're trying to spray a grass out of a grass, uh, Roundup isn't going to work in that scenario, neither is 2,4-D, so we no. have to get to some pretty complex stuff. And timing is really important, and moisture conditions matter. And yeah. And maybe we, and I think the process, the thought process we're getting to now is that we can't spray that every year. Otherwise, we get some crop damage uh, because that chemistry hangs out in the soil uh, yeah. over a period of time. Yeah. And, and to some extent, that's a good thing because you get control of those grassy weeds that you don't want uh, for a little <laughs> bit longer. But also, if you start stacking up one one application on top of the next even even uh, a year apart even though the label might allow it you mm-hmm. might be setting that timothy back bottom line that not is a problem grass yeah. for us yeah and and it's something we're we're constantly trying to to figure out and and there's just nothing working yet really there's nothing there's no wonder drug for it yet i mean there's things that kind of work at it and kind of do some damage to it but there's really nothing that it's like a slam dunk and so and not even fallow rotations i have some experience with fallow rotations where it's still coming back even after two or three years of chem fallow the only thing that not a doesn't hold up to that is tillage and if you can go in there and dig it up and just if you can sprout that seed, dig it up, sprout it, dig it up. I mean that you're going to control it that way. You know, when we were growing bluegrass, we had we had the vet not a problem, and there's ways to control it in bluegrass a little better. Um, but it still wasn't. I mean, we had to tear our bluegrass out every you know, ten years or so. We may end up. I think what we may end up doing is keeping a shorter rotation. In our, so not keeping our Timothy in production as long. We may get six years instead of nine, uh, nine crops, you know, something like that. Um, I'm so, coming to the same thought process. The, my worst mm-hmm. fields, I've had a disc running all week up until, of course, <laughs> uh, we had some weather delays here. A lot of folks are awful in favor of no-till and, and mm-hmm. herbicide treatments. I think on the occasion there's still some place for tillage and this yeah. is this is one of those places mm-hmm. we yeah. might be able to incorporate yeah. some no till once you have tillage in place uh, once right. you rotate out to a different crop where you have some different chemistries that you can use on ventanata uh, that you can't use in timothy it's definitely going to be a combination of tillage and cultural practices and not just sure. relying on on chemi- uh, different chemistries not not mm-hmm. hoping for a magic bullet to come along because I don't know that it will. We're in our annual cropping. We're totally conventional. I mean, and now a lot of guys around here still are uh, in in on the Palouse. There's a lot of still conventional guys. Um, I think the problem going straight no till for us in you know, in the Midwest, I think it's a little easier just because there's some organic matter in the dirt already. Where I'm farming, uh, there, I have no organic matter in the dirt. Even if you did try to go to a no-till, okay, you build up your organic matter in that first couple inches or whatever. It's still, you know, still at that root zone, three, four, five inches down. That the clay, our clay dirt, just seals up so tight that we can't do anything. Yeah, with it. I mean. You know, we we still moldboard plow everything. There's some guys that chisel plow, and there's some guys that rip, disc rip kind of thing. But we need those chunks, you know, to last through the winter to try to, you know, keep dirt chunky, mm-hmm. to try to keep moisture and air and things in there, you know, those kinds of things in the soil. Because if without it, I mean, it turns into concrete. Right. And, and two, and the other problem, and you can't hold this dirt. And with our hills, I mean, it makes it even worse. And, and that's where grass, Timothy Hay, fits in really well. Because it's, a in our thinking, it's kind of a modified no-till. You know, you can get crops off it. You're not tilling the ground, and, and you're doing pretty good. But I, 
but I just know, I mean, just from the experience, when we're pulling out a grass crop that's been in for 10 years, that ground is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is is rough on things when you're pulling that stuff out. Absolutely. So. Uh, you're probably mm-hmm. familiar with clay so tough you can bounce a basketball on it. All you got to do is put up hoops yeah. far enough apart and you got a court on some of my fields. Yep. What do you think your biggest challenge is right now? Sticking just to our hay in operation, I would say finding labor is a really tough thing right now. And I think that's for all, all of agriculture, or, or at least farmers, finding the help to get things done and to get them done right and to get things done in a timely fashion too. Because in hand, we all know that I mean, timing is everything. Stuff needs to get swathed or mowed or whatever. But when it needs to get swathed, it needs to go down. And when it needs to be raked or tedded, it needs to be raked or tedded. When it needs to be baled, it needs to be baled. And with our operation, because every everything, because we have so many acres, we have to have basically a driver for everything. And, and finding that tough. And I think part of it, too, is just the nature of of agriculture jobs being you know it's really hard for that needs 15 guys for harvest to employ 15 guys year round (laughs) yeah that's just not doable yeah and it's really only for four weeks right at the most and 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 in our case okay so we have hay in season hay harvest that last four weeks that last week of june to you know, middle of July, you know, kind of that three, four week stretch. And then, then we kind of have a break. And then in our case, we have our, our wheat harvest. And then we need a couple guys for that. And, and that's really hard to find. I mean, luckily we have our families big enough. We can, you know, pull our family from you, you, we need you for a week here, take a week of vacation here. From your day job, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah come here and you come here and we'll make it all work. But, and we can rely on that fairly confidently, but I think in general, just finding guys that are willing to come out here. Cause the other thing too, is farmers aren't going to be able to pay what, you know, mechanic jobs or can pay or anything like that, you know, certainly just, yeah. just not, just not the way it is. Or, well, that is the way it is, I guess. But uh, how do you address that going forward? Is it more automation? And do you ever see being able to automate your processes, like I'm talking robotic tractors, on your right. hillsides? See, that's something I I don't know. I think that's going to work better in the Midwest where everything's a little flatter and a little squarer, and, or, well, flatter at least. Um, there's so much variable in our ground. I mean, we have a springy spot. We can't farm it because... <laughs> you'll get stuck, you know, and it's hard for a, for a GPS tractor to, or, or there's a ditch that, that we have to work in and smooth up. You can't tell a computer to do that. I think if we were in to our operation, if we were to do anything automated, I mean, you know, we may use drones for spraying or something like that. Um, We could do that. You know, drones, they have the ability to kind of, all you're doing is just flying over terrain. I mean, I have a drone that can do that right now. So, I mean, that that technology is there, um, and I think we could possibly use. You have a couple of different families involved in your operation. Uh, yeah. How are you guys working through the transition from one generation to the next? Well, I'll tell you, I guess... We're still trying to figure that out. My dad and my uncle, um, they own the operation and they have their own thing going. You know, something I didn't mention earlier is my brother and I are starting to ease our way into making our own operation. We we just picked up 500 acres of our own. Um, we're leasing from some gentlemen in the area. Um, that we're leasing ourselves about 500 acres. It's basically just integrated into the whole operation. But, uh, you know, it's something that uh, everybody around here is thinking about. It's really tough. (laughs) 
uh, you know, I'm, we don't know all the answers. Something my dad tells me is there's not going to be a perfect solution and there's just not, it's not going to be, make everybody happy, but it's at the end of the day, we're all family and we all have to get along. And, uh, and I think that's the, the biggest thing is nothing, the farm itself isn't bigger than the family. Our, you know, your family is what comes first. Everybody has to remember that. And that's, that's really best way I can put it. <laughs> that sounds like some pretty good advice. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's always great to talk to you, most especially because we're in the same production region and face a lot of the same issues. It goes beyond the equipment and the weeds and, and the dirt to so many other things. So thank you for joining us. Thanks. Yeah, this is fun. 